Hi, welcome to the Parenting Bridge podcast. I'm Dr. Michelle Alden, a licensed professional counselor, parent coach, and family therapist. And I'm here to help you to build a bridge to your best family possible. Hey there. I wanted to talk to you tonight about kids that are very disconnected and maybe even detached. And I'm in that, I want to talk about attachment and building connection as well. It's a big problem in our society. A lot of times I hear adults blaming the video games and the screen time, and yet it's, it's kind of a family thing. So I want to talk about this in light of family and connection and how important that is. And hopefully this will give you some good ideas on some ways that you can work on this in your home and just really build those connections because they are really, really important. And it's true. Our kids today are really, not just kids, like we as people, I think, are very disconnected. We have social media to kind of feel connected and we have these different ways that that we might feel connected. But I think even in our smaller groups, a lot of times people are just feeling very, very disconnected. So disconnected kids is a really big issue because at a time when they need that guidance and they need to build their social skills and help their brain to develop the connections. We, we are, I believe that we're created to connect, that we, we need deep, meaningful connections throughout our life. And as people, that we weren't meant to be alone and to be kind of lone rangers and figure everything out ourselves. I think that we need deep and lasting connections. So a lot of times in our families, everybody has separated because of how hard it is or isolated because it's there's this feeling of crisis or stress and stress makes us kind of everyone move away and push away and kids that are come from chaotic backgrounds that have very insecure attachments that have had trauma they really struggle also to make deep connections and and so it's not how it was meant to be it's not how it it should be and I think it's important to recognize first that we're, we weren't really meant to live in kind of these isolated worlds where we don't really talk to people or really communicate with people. I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you see somebody that you haven't seen for a long time, but you know them on social media. And instead of being able to talk to them about, you know, things that you've been doing or asking them about things that they've been doing, it's like you already know, right? So I... I've had that where people have said, oh, we see that you're doing this and that. And you don't even have to really even talk because these people are telling you everything uh, that they think that they know about your life because of pictures that you posted or something like that. And it's kind of sad, I think, because we meet together with people we want to be able to share, not just, you know, what we did, but the emotion or the experiences behind it. So I think that we we kind of are losing this. It tends to be a problem, not just with kids. So with our, our kids, I want you to think about in your family some of the things that you can do to make connections and how important that is. So, and it's a lot of times it's it's little things. I work in a lot of homes in the evenings when people, when the kids are coming home from school, when parents are, you know, one parent is maybe coming home from work. And it's always fascinating to me to just kind of watch what happens. How do people greet the parent that's been away? How how are the kids greeted when they come home? And I think it's it, sometimes it can be different for, with each child. And every child is different too, what they want, what they feel. And a lot of my work that I do is in post-adoption, working with adopted families. And so there's often a disconnect too between you know, how this child interacts versus maybe a biological child. And so just take some time and just think about those interactions when people first come home and what that looks like. And and it may be that you're going to the school and picking your child up and, you know, how they get into the car and how you interact and how people take turns, you know, talking about their day or not taking turns and talking over each other. And I've had those times certainly with raising my kids where, you know, everybody's mom, 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 mom. And I would think, oh gosh, like just talk to each other for five minutes, you know? And so 
teaching kind of that cadence of somebody it says something and then you know somebody else can say something and not talking over each other if we don't have that practice if we don't work on that in our homes there's a really good chance that it's not going to get worked on anywhere i mean in school kids have to learn to raise their hand and you know take their turn to talk and to communicate but we don't know for sure if that's happening, right? Like some kids are just blurting things out. We know that a lot of kids have impulsive behaviors. And so just teaching them to calm down, to take their turn to wait is really important. And we can do that at home. So, and it can start really, really young. Most families I work with have variants of ages from teenagers all the way down sometimes to toddlers. And I think that social skills, if you start to teach those really young, are amazing and awesome, and it helps everybody. A lot of the things that we do in teaching just kind of basic good responses and social language skills with our parent coaching, it helps their brain, and it helps all the kids in the family to be able to kind of build those neural pathways to where they can communication is a key to the connection and to better behaviors, really. And so it's a huge, important piece, how we say things, how we interact. So think about just the simplicity of, you know, when people have been away all day, how we come back home. And I've been in homes where a parent comes home and people don't even acknowledge that person or maybe one person might say hi. And then, but then I've been in other families where somebody comes home and kids, especially the younger ones, will be like, oh, you know, dad's home and run to dad and, and say hello. But I, And I've seen both parts of that. And so, you know, you might, as you look at your family and how they do that, I want you to think about what you want that to be like. So if everybody comes home at once, that can be really overwhelming. It can be overwhelming for one person coming home and everyone already there and, and getting them. But but what do you want that to look like? You know, do you want, do you do, when I had a rule when my kids were growing up that when someone came home, they needed to find somebody, another adult in the home to say, hey, I'm home. So that we could say, you know, how are you? Glad you're home. Welcome home. You know, that kind of thing. With with adoptive families, I've worked with a couple of families that just do such a great job of saying, you know, when the kids come home, like, welcome home, you know, and just reinforcing, like, I'm glad you're here. I think that all of us crave to celebrated. And so I think it is really important to take a moment with each child and be like, oh, you know, how was your day? Even though they might, the kids are not ready to answer that question, I still found that not asking it is a mistake. And so, you know, how, how are you doing? Even though they just say fine and you can establish what you want that to look like in your home, like, you know, giving a hug or, but just something where it's an intentional greeting, I think is really important to establish connection in and you can look for other places. So those are big ones, right? Like they come home from school, but there's a reconnection when we've all been asleep at night and apart from each other. How do we greet each other in the morning? And some kids are ready to talk and be up and going. You as a parent may not be fully awake and ready for everything that some kids have to offer. So I like setting some routines up in the morning. And part of that has to do with so how you can connect with them to start the day. So it usually works best if the kids are not up first and then you come wandering, you know, into the fray that's already happening. So I recommend that kids stay in their room until whatever time it is that you say you're going to get up. I have some parents that are morning people and so they get up early and they have that time to kind of get themselves together and get ready. And then they, you know, how you greet those children when they, when they come into your space, especially I had one mom that would get up early and then had a child that would get up early. And so we established a morning routine where she had some things that she could do in the morning. She would come and say that she was awake and then she had her things to do in her room so that mom could have her quiet time. When my grandson lived with me for a while, I had him sit. He could sit and he could draw while I sat and journaled or, you know, something like that. So you can kind of establish like this is quiet time. This is how we do it. So you're teaching that as you go. I think that if you talk about being grumpy in the morning and them being grumpy or you being grumpy, it can be detrimental because it is still a connecting. And we, and we, even if we're grumpy, 
you know, how are we going to connect with each other? And so for my kids that didn't want to talk in the morning, that connection might look a lot different. Like they weren't talkative. They didn't want to answer a lot of questions. They didn't want to say a lot. And that's totally fine. I just requested that if somebody says good morning, the right thing to say back is good morning back. You don't have to say any more than that. Sometimes scripting something out for a child is all the connection that you need. So so think about those other those times of the day when you're connecting after being apart. The other one is in our program, we have you have some downtime every day. And so how we finish the downtime and how kids come out from that and how we re-engage. And then also, you know, when kids, you might have like older kids that go out and play or do something. So how they come back into the house and how they connect and how they integrate back in is really, really important. It's a transition. And it's a transition that I think we forget that we have to teach. And the other piece of connecting that I think is really fascinating is how we handle when someone leaves. Do people just get up and leave? Like, oh, did they did they leave? Did they make it, you know, who's here, who's not here? Some parents have no idea. Like somebody just walked out the door or someone gets up and leaves, you know, in the room and, and goes and uses the bathroom or whatever. It's like they don't need permission. I'm not saying that our kids have to have permission for everything that they do. I want them to just acknowledge that we're here together. And if I need to excuse myself, I need to say that like, oh, I need to use the restroom. Excuse me. Or I'm leaving now. I've, I've got to go. And so how you leave. And, and as a family, you get to decide how you're going to do that. Do you give a hug when you leave? Do you make sure that you say, okay, bye. I love you. Take, be careful. What is it that you want to leave your kids with, whether it's in the morning to go to school or whether they're, you know, going to their friend's house or going to another parent's house? How do we leave? And then that also as a family, what do you do when your guest leaves? What do you want to teach your kids about when your friends leave? You know, there's a lot of kids that aren't being taught this, that someone leaves and they're like, yeah, you know, whatever. They're playing their video game or on their phone and they don't even acknowledge that someone was there. You know, thank you for coming, anything like that. But those little things that we're losing in our society have a lot to do with how we also connect and how disconnected we are. These are real people, right? Like a game can be paused, but real people's lives can't be. And so we want to remember that people are more important than things. And so put the game down and walk your friend to the door. It's okay to stop. I remember a long time ago, we had some family friends that when we would visit them and then when we would leave, it was their tradition that everyone would go outside, you know, to say goodbye and they would run down the sidewalk until you got to the corner where you would turn and they'd be waving the whole time. And we wasn't like we lived a million miles away, you know, but this is what they did as a family. And they all, everyone that was home, like that's what they did, even though there was probably some of the kids that my kids were more friendly with than other kids. So like I said, it doesn't have to be anything big or major or a big to do, but it just, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be talked about how you're going to do that as a family and what your expectations are. I think that it's not okay to just complain about how our kids are so into their game or whatever that they can't stop for a minute and they're not acknowledging people if we haven't taught those skills. And that's what, where I think that we're kind of lacking sometimes. Now, in some families, when you have, especially like I see in adoptive families, you have some kids that are really truly disconnected and have attachment issues. I think that it's really important to recognize that some kids can't just be left on their own. If you give them too much time alone because of their trauma, they lose themselves. They get even more disconnected. A lot of kids will create chaos that will bring people into their chaos. And as soon as they've brought people into the chaos, they kind of will step back and isolate and kind of watch and see how you deal with that. So be aware of what's happening with your child and just know that some kids, they can't handle too much time alone because they do disconnect and they almost are disassociative through that. So keeping kids in the here and now, and that's a lot of what we do with our Healthy Foundations Family Program, is we teach you how to move through the day and to stay, keep people connected still be able to build in some times for autonomy and space and some things like that. How to teach kids how to play, how to play together, how to play separately is all things that I think we just feel like, oh, people should know, right? Kids should know how to play. If your kids have come from a different background, if they've come from a lot of chaos and trauma, 
they probably don't even really know how to play, how to use their imagination, how to engage with someone else. I think another piece of learning how to connect and engage, it helps our kids with other kids, right? Like what do they do if a group of kids are talking and they want to enter in the conversation? Do they know how to do that in a healthy way? What if we started teaching that to our kids? Like, hey, you know, what would you say if, you know, how would you handle this? And working through those scenarios, not just something they did wrong, but just scripting out for them these kind of social skills. Don't worry about them being awkward. The, most of the time, the kids that I work with that have a lot of behavior problems are socially awkward anyway. Junior high kids are socially awkward anyway. They're not going to be any more awkward because they know how to greet somebody. They know how to shake hands with somebody. They, they're not going to shake hands with their friend and be weird. Like They're going to know how to make those adjustments, but we still want to teach those skills. We don't want to lose those skills. It really is important to our overall health, well-being, and functioning. That's a little bit about connecting and how important it is and just some practical ways to look for how your family deals with disconnecting and how you connect and reconnect. And, and when are the times during the day when you have that connection? A lot of times, I mean, you know, having dinner together is a great time to connect, but doesn't it's not it doesn't always go the way that we want. Sometimes it's, it can be very chaotic. Don't be afraid to slow things down and just, you know, okay, we're going to sit here for a minute and everyone's going to share one thing that they did today that was helpful. You know, everybody's going to share a high and a low or, you know, something like that. And teaching our kids to let someone else talk. Did you hear what they said? It, there's things happening so fast these you know, in our rapid fire world. And we're used to getting a lot of input from a lot of different directions. So slowing things down when we play family games may feel chaotic to you, or it's like, oh, that was, you know, all about so-and-so winning or losing or whatever, but it still provides for connection. Another really big connecting thing that I think is invaluable, of more important than getting all the homework done is having family reading time together where a parent, not the kids reading to you, but a parent reads to the kids and you kind of create this atmosphere of this, the listening, right? And when someone gets restless, we can pause, have them come sit, you know, everyone can sit in close, you can be comfortable and cozy and having that kind of downtime where we regroup not, and it's interesting because reading out loud uses a different part of the brain than, than when someone's just reading to themselves. So even for you as the reader out loud, it actually is more emotional and also for your kids listening it's so important for them so i always read books that i want my kids to have read and so we we would read those out loud as a family and it just it was always kind of a highlight part of the day sometimes when we were homeschooling we would start the day off with some reading and we would kind of end the day with that and as the kids grew sometimes they would do reading with their younger siblings so it creates this really just healthy feeling and connection and everybody can be a part of it because everyone can use their own mind and in their imagination. And, and yes, I think family movies can be a connecting time, but not quite the same as family reading. So think about those little things that you can do to just build in connection and know that just have confidence that as you're doing those things, it really is a connecting time. It has a lot of value to it. Thank you. And if you want to know more and you want to learn more, I have a book called Parenting Emotionally Distressed Kids, Building a Bridge to Better Behaviors. You can buy that anywhere that you buy books. Amazon's probably the best bet for getting that book. And you can listen to our Parenting Bridge podcast. Be sure to subscribe and tell other people about us. Glad we could help. Thanks for listening to The Parenting Bridge. Do you want to learn more about building a bridge to better behaviors? Pick up a copy of Dr. Michelle Alden's new book, Parenting Emotionally Distressed Kids. Or for more resources, you can click on the link for Healthy Foundations. If you would like to leave a comment or a question for Dr. Alden, there's a link in the notes. We'll see you next time. And remember, things can always get better.